there is a land in South America, Guyana. It's home to one of the world's most legendary creatures. It rarely encounters man, yet it has gained the reputation of being a merciless killer, even of humans. An expedition has been mounted to find out the truth about the biggest snake in the world. The anaconda's true nature, even its real size, are shrouded in mystery and exaggerated in hunter's stories. Young Sandy, Marion Perlman, and cameraman Mike Alicott want to find out the truth about the anaconda. And team leader Rainer Bergermatz has brought along the most advanced equipment to find the biggest anaconda in the world. The tropical lowlands of South America. Swamps, savanna, and impenetrable forests. They extend from Argentina in the south all the way north to Guyana. It's the dry season here in Guyana, but there's no shortage of water. It's a rich habitat for a variety of animal species. Several hundred species of birds live here. And the dense forests are home to rare cats such as the ocelot while the waterways are the realm of the Black Cayman. It's the birds that bring the first sign of an anaconda. Black turkey vultures are the first to pick up the scent of a carcass. The royal vultures aren't far behind. Bigger and more powerful than their black cousins, they take over, ripping the skin off the carcass. The giant anaconda offers enough pickings to satisfy all. The stench is overpowering. Reiner and Jung keep their distance. Taking off isn't easy on a full stomach. Even with a powerful two-meter wingspan, it takes enormous effort. As things grow quieter around the carcass of the snake, Reiner and Jung have an opportunity to take a closer look at the anaconda. They measure the snake from the head to the tip of its tail. So this is how much money? So the last is 120 million. Last is 120. How much is it? Five meters, more or less. At five meters, this is one of the largest specimens. More than 300 thin ribs point skywards. They alone support the great weight of the snake. On dry land, the anaconda is usually sluggish and slow. Nevertheless, the capybaras are on their guard. But this time, there's no danger. The anaconda is full and no longer hungry. The capybaras quickly settle again. 
They live in family groups and spend most of their time in or near water. They like to graze on the lush grasses and aquatic vegetation of the Guyana lowlands. For the birds, too, these are ideal conditions. There's no shortage of insects and small fish for them to eat. This year, the dry season has come to an end in March, around four weeks earlier than usual, and the water levels start to rise. For the team, this means wet feet and tough going with so much heavy gear. It also means the giant anacondas will be more difficult to find. They're not rare, but their greenish-brown color means they're pretty well camouflaged. Finding one basking in the sun would be a real stroke of luck. It depends who senses who first. Anacondas have poor eyesight, but they make up for it with their especially sensitive receptors for heat, scent, and vibrations. Okay, we take the camera, underwater camera. The team have ways to follow the anaconda. A small underwater camera is quickly assembled. Seems to be a smaller one, maybe two meter, two and a half meter. Reiner's video glasses show him what the camera sees, even in the brightest sunlight. This is a small snake, nowhere near the record they're seeking. But perhaps the local Amerindians will help find a monster anaconda. Theodore, an old native Amerindian, swears that in his youth, he once came face to face with a monster anaconda. Theodore knows the area like the back of his hand, and he knows where to look for a really big snake. It's the accounts of the locals that keep the myth of man-eating snakes alive. But the team believe there may be enough truth in the stories to help them in their search. So, Mr. CEO, Mike told me you have a nice story about the huge anaconda from the old days. Please, can you tell me this story? Yes, I can tell you this story, yes, because I could remember since, since 60 years ago. I had plenty cattle. Theodore explains that his cattle began to disappear, but they never found any remains. He decided to go with his brother to the Itchy Pond. There, they found a trail leading into the water. The young men didn't know how to interpret the trail. They searched the banks for more signs, but they didn't find any. In the end, they decided to wait it out. Young Theodore had an uneasy feeling, but he didn't want to appear a coward in front of his brother. They settled down to wait. Wait long, nothing, nothing at all. 
Then all they found one was one turtle. Pick him up, say, launch, boy, launch. And then the incredible happened. Only his brother's quick reactions prevented the worst. It was the biggest snake he had ever seen. And after that, everything was fine. No more cows disappeared. And after that, everything went good now. Nothing, none of us go no more. If you want to see big anaconda, you have to go to the Ichpan, and there you would find big anaconda. But finding each pond won't be easy. There are many waterways to choose from, and the way can be dangerous. The team find a high-tech solution. Jan Peter Mavis has worked in Guyana for many years as a flying instructor. He's just returned from a first reconnaissance flight and has an idea where it might be worth taking a closer look. A very interesting area. So, we're here, and I flew over as far as this hill. It seems as if the forest thins out a bit here. It becomes a kind of swampland without any trees. I guess that would be round about here, from here to there. Let me look at the scale, about five miles. Let's go. The ultralight is also equipped with a camera, which can broadcast live pictures of the landscape to the ground station. Marion for Jan. Base for Jan, loud and clear. Hello, Jan. I'm ready. You can switch on the camera. Over. Okay, I'm switching on. Yeah, super. Is it clearing up over there? Over. Yes, I've just flown around the hill further southwards. It looks as if the whole area becomes marshland. Now it's opening up a bit. It also looks as if there's more water there. Over. Over. Yes, the water areas are getting bigger. Would you say that that's the pond we're looking for? Yes, I think so. It's the only one. The rest of the ponds are smaller. The team moves in as close as possible to each pond. Then the new technology takes over. This is the drone, specially designed by Rainer and Marion to cope with this kind of terrain. It's equipped with cameras, a distance measuring device, and a GPS transmitter. It's controlled by a special cyber glove on Marion's right hand. A movement, the push of a button, and the drone changes direction. Marion sees the picture taken by the camera on the mini screen of her video glasses. Jung transmits GPS data from the drone to Marion. The first mission goes like clockwork, but navigating on the basis of the GPS data is highly complicated. Every flight requires intense concentration. On the way to Itch Pond, the drone comes across a tapir. A good opportunity to put the size recording technology to the test. There's something in the front. Can you see it? Reiner quickly enters the necessary commands. I get a nice picture here. I put on TC8 now. 
TC80 is on, extracted. Okay, I got the reading. And before the tape here can run off into the distance, its data is stored. Approximate length, 2.5 meters. The drone has passed the test and continues on towards each pond. The old Amerindian Theodore was right. Itch Pond is indeed the home of the green anaconda. This is not only the largest of the four anaconda species, but the largest snake in the world. Scientists believe they may grow to more than nine meters long. Okay, Reiner and cameraman Mike discover a big anaconda. Just check at the center part. I, I zoom in, okay. The anaconda feels the vibrations of the helicopter and takes evasive action. This pond offers such ideal conditions that it must be teeming with large snakes. But will the legendary giant snake be found here? Have you seen anything so far? Yes, I'm seeing some, something on the left hand side of the screen here. Checking the. Okay, my there is something on the left hand corner. The and drone down, makes a new sighting. Lower. Okay, Maron, this is great. This is great. Can you try to fly over it? Okay, this is great. Marion maneuvers into the best position to take the measurements. Get a reading. Now this is five meter plus five, meter. five and a half meters. Over. Still not what they're looking for. Okay, my hand up okay. Um, can you check on the other side of the lake? Uh, let's turn around. So far, the technology has worked perfectly. But then something goes wrong. Okay, Marion, Marion, I have a warning here. You're getting low, there's three ahead of you. Look, 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 look. Oh, Marion, look. A very shaky oh. picture now. The remote control really is no longer right. responding. Finally, the data retrieval system breaks down altogether. We don't have any readings here. Huh? We don't have any readings, Mario. May I win? This, can, you, can you come back, please, May I win? Oh, shit. There's no reading here. No one knows exactly what's gone wrong. One of the cameras is still rolling here because it can still see a picture. You can still see something here. Oh, yeah. One is still working. What? One camera is still working. But it's not flying. At least there's a picture on the screen. But with the GPS transmission down, there's no way of knowing where the drone is. And where is it? Huh. Then the battery gives out. They search at the edge of the swamp and from the microlight. But it's hopeless. When the wet season comes to an end, isolated pools begin to dry up. Giant anacondas could get stranded. But this elderly female finds just enough water to support her enormous weight of 80 to 100 kilos. And it's easier to breathe too. At least you won't have to worry about food in the near future. Anacondas eat only a few times a year.
the sun beats down mercilessly. In a few days' time, the water is gone. In some places, anacondas bury themselves deep in the silt in order to survive the dry period. Or they seek shelter in the damp, cool spaces under roots and tree trunks. Some anacondas are known to migrate to areas with more water if their territory dries up completely. It's quite common for the snakes to have different territories in the rainy season and in the dry season. as dry as tinder. One spark is enough to set the savannah in flames. Up in the sky, birds of prey are circling. They know the flames will flush out small mammals and swarms of insects. Easy pickings for the hovering birds. Fresh vegetation soon covers the areas charred by the bushfire. The cycle begins anew. But the really big anacondas won't be found in regions which are only flooded in the wet season. Not for nothing do the Amerindians call the anaconda Yakup Mama, mother of the water. On the banks of the big rivers, their bayous, and in the bordering forests, Rainer Bergamatz and his team should find ideal conditions to spot a really big monster. It takes two days to reach the Buruburu River in the south of Guyana, they must penetrate as far into the wilderness as possible, where shy birds and caiman are plentiful. They know they will also find anaconda. The aguti paka, a herbivore about the size of a dog, is a favorite prey for the snakes. The short-sighted anaconda picks up the agouti's scent with its tongue. If it were really hungry, the agouti wouldn't stand a chance. When it means business, an anaconda can trap its prey with a velocity of six meters a second. Anacondas only attack sloths in the water but the deer will make a tasty morsel. Anacondas are said to be capable of eating whole cattle, earning their nickname, bull killers. Now the team can film the rarest of sights, an anaconda giving birth to its young. For around seven months, the female snake has been carrying up to 80 eggs. It has fasted for the entire gestation period and lost up to 20% of its weight. The young slide out of their mother's body.
Freeing themselves from the umbilical cord and egg membrane costs the young an enormous effort. This is their first big test. have to take care of themselves from the outset. They will receive no parental care from their mother. Anaconda babies are giants among young snakes. They can be up to 90 centimeters long. Gestation and birthing exhaust an anaconda so much that it will only produce young every two years. The female needs a few days to recover. Most of the young have already abandoned her. Most will not survive their first few months. The team has reached the headwaters of the Boroboro River, but they want to go still further upstream. The area is uninhabited by humans, but small groups of natives come here to fish and hunt. This is a useful encounter for information about anacondas. Just a couple of days ago, they spotted a very big anaconda, coiled round a tree. It sounds promising. The expedition is on the right track. The black caiman is a good sign too. It shares its habitat with the anaconda. And the two aren't exactly the best of friends. Depending on their size, one will prey on the other, often after a fierce struggle. The biggest snake in the world against the mightiest saurian. is on the side of this small anaconda. The caiman would almost certainly have won, but the arrival of the camera team scares him off. The search continues for the anaconda the fisherman mentioned. Finding your way seems almost impossible in the dense rainforest. But Jung grew up here and knows how to follow the almost invisible machete marks left by the fishermen days earlier. They're looking for the tree the fishermen told them about. Since the giant snakes tend to stay in one place for a long time, it should still be there.
The impressive head suggests this is a really big specimen. They approach cautiously. Anacondas are not poisonous, but they have powerful jaws. This one measures around six meters, big, but not record-breaking. The exact length can't be determined, as long as the animal is alive and flexing its muscles. This giant isn't dangerous for the time being. It's a female surrounded by young. It's still exhausted from the strain of giving birth. The young, on the other hand, should be treated with caution. These miniature versions of the monster snake are decidedly aggressive. The search continues, deeper and deeper into the forest. This is called the Green Hell, a place where myths are born. Once upon a time, while in search of new places to settle, Amerindians came across an insurmountably high, shiny wall. They decided to follow it in the hope of finding a gap. After two days, they finally reached the end. The huge head of an anaconda. The wall in the jungle was the gigantic body of a snake. The team is familiar with such stories. It's the dream of confronting the myth of the giant anaconda that drives them on. The unaccustomed noise disturbs the wildlife. The boat inches forwards. At last, the impenetrable canopy above their heads opens, and the waterway becomes a little wider. A tapir rushes out of the thicket on the bank. It's one of the giants of the rainforest. This puma is still young and inexperienced, or it would know that it's best not to tangle with a tapir. It tries to get closer without getting its feet wet. Pumas are not fond of water. It doesn't stand a chance of catching the tapir. At the end of the dry season, the large rivers of Guyana's lowlands and their bayous once again become vast expanses of water. After the exertions in the dense rainforest, the steady progress here is a welcome change. In this deserted region, there's enough water all year round to attract a large number of animals. Giant otters can always find plenty of fish here. 
They're excited and try to drive away the intruders by diving in and out of the water. Carpets of Amazonas, giant water lilies, cover large areas of water. Their leaves can bear a weight of up to 40 kilograms. The calm atmosphere affects the whole team. It's hot and sticky. They all stare straight ahead. The small anaconda on the water lily leaf doesn't arouse any bursts of enthusiasm. More out of routine, Mike uses his special binoculars. From the image and inbuilt rainfinder, it's possible to calculate the size. At under three meters, this animal is probably a male. The really big specimens are always females. In the murky waters between the leaves, the creature is virtually invisible. Only the head can be seen. It makes for the clearer waters at the river's edge still invisible to its prey, until it strikes like lightning. Bite, constrict, and kill is the order of business. After a meal, anacondas often lie around lazily for months while they digest. It's time for the next big mission. What looks like a toy submarine is in fact packed full of expensive precision technology. The small ROV has a camera on board. It transmits the pictures from the depths of the lake to the surface, onto the laptop. This device promises pictures no one has seen before. An arrow turtle glides through the water. This is one of the biggest freshwater turtles in the world. Its shell can grow up to one meter in length. Next, a mata mata turtle swims in front of the lens. The tufts on the head and neck serve as camouflage among reeds and dead leaves. Most of the time it lies motionless on the bed of the lake, where it feeds on the fish it ambushes. But something else has found the sub rather unexpectedly. The submarine has been knocked into the reeds and can maneuver neither forwards nor backwards. The team can't afford another loss. But at least this machine can be saved. And suddenly, Marion has the closest possible encounter with a giant anaconda. She will later tell of a docile and totally relaxed creature. When asked how big this mighty snake might have been, she will say eight meters, close to the record. But to Marion, the statistics are no longer important. is a moment she will never forget.
The area around the lake has proved so promising that the team has decided to stay for more research. Anacondas are also nocturnal, and the team have the technology to accommodate this. Jung and Marion work with a small, remote-controlled car. This, too, carries a camera. Jung controls the vehicle via GPS signals using the viewfinder of his video glasses. The car also has an infrared camera. It senses the heat radiated by living creatures. The yellow and red areas are the warmest. Blue stands for cool and cold spots. The anaconda has a heat sensor too, which helps it to track its prey. However, it won't notice the cold car. So this is a possible way to approach the snake unnoticed. Not far away, Reiner and Mike have built a platform in the middle of a pond. They're going to try to lure the anaconda out of the water. But so far, the snakes are keeping cover. In the meantime, the camera car is working well. It's come across a herd of collared peccary. They don't take any notice of the strange visitor and continue foraging for food. It's worth keeping an eye on these hogs as they're typical prey for anaconda. The snake must see these animals in roughly the same way. On the platform, Reiner and Mike are suspending a line over the water. Anacondas are legendary for being able to catapult themselves out of the water to catch their prey. They're going to use this small furry toy monkey as bait. They give it a warm belly. That should do the trick. A quick check to see if the infrared camera is working. The thermometer registers exactly 37 degrees. The preparations are completed. Once the decoy is suspended over the water, all they can do is wait. The miniature jeep creeps through the undergrowth. No sign of an anaconda. Only a tapir arouses Jung and Marion's interest. They test the thermal image camera again. For Mike and Reiner, the waiting has paid off. A mighty anaconda stirs down below. But one of the caimans gets there first. Experiment successful, even though it was the wrong animal. The miniature jeep is still going. Jung navigates it through the undergrowth, so far without any notable success. And now it's stuck. Yeah, what is going on, sir? Something is moving there. It's shaking the car. Moving? They switch on the thermal image camera to look for an explanation. But there's nothing there. No. Nothing. Okay. Put on the light. 
It takes another spotlight to show what has held the car up. You can see it? Yeah, it looks like an anaconda with a spot. Can you free the car? A small anaconda. By no means a monster specimen, but right now, Marion and Jung couldn't care less. Okay, now we follow it. Let's see where it's going. It's probably a male. The reptile crawls steadily through the forest as if it were following an invisible trail. At the break of day, the male anaconda is still on the move. The way it keeps flicking the air suggests that it's following a particular scent. Although the males of the giant anaconda only grow up to three meters, they're still imposing creatures. The team follow at a safe distance and witness a fascinating spectacle that takes place every year at the end of the dry season in Guyana's tropical lowlands. More than 10 males are coiled around one single female. Her pheromones have guided them here, often over great distances. Knotted together like this, they often hold out in a breeding ball for days or even weeks. A mighty, majestic female, courted by a dozen diminutive suitors. Impossible to tell which one will finally get his chance. The embrace seems almost tender. No one's worrying now about record lengths calculated with the help of state-of-the-art equipment. Ultimately, it's the direct encounter with the largest snake in the world that marks the real success of this expedition. Only when the female has had enough does she break up the ball. A many-headed hydra, an endless snake body. Perhaps we have found the origin of the myth of the all-consuming monster.